A man was involved in an uh, accident at work, so he filed the necessary insurance claim. And the insurance company contacted him and said that they needed more information. And so this was his reply to their request. I'm writing in response to your request for additional information to block number three of the accident reporting form. I wrote poor planning as the cause of my accident. You said in your letter that I should explain more fully, so I hope the following detail will be sufficient. As you know, I'm a brick mason, and on the day of the accident, I was working alone on top of a building. When I finished, I discovered that over the course of the day, I'd carried up about 300 pounds of extra bricks, which I didn't need. So trying to determine how to get them down without having to carry them you know, up and down and up and down, he said I decided to lower them in a small barrel by using a pulley, which was attached to a beam um, that was secured at the top of the building. He tied the rope on the ground level, went up to the top, filled the bucket with uh, the bricks, then went back down to the ground and untied the rope, holding it tightly to ensure a slow descent of the bricks. He said, you will note, however, in block number 11 of the accident reporting form that I weigh only 150 pounds. So here he is, 150 pounds with 300 pounds of bricks. I lost my presence of mind uh, due to the surprise of being jerked off the ground suddenly uh, and forgot to let go of the rope. Needless to say, I proceeded up the side of the building at a rather rapid rate, and in the vicinity of the 40-foot level, which is about halfway, the bricks and he met uh, on the respective travels. He said, this explains my fractured skull and broken collar bone. Slowed only slightly, I continued my rapid ascent and um, stopping when the fingers of my left hand were two knuckles deep into the pulley. Fortunately, by this time, I had regained my presence of mind and was able to hold on to the rope in spite of my pain. At approximately the same time, however, the barrel hit the ground and the bottom broke out of it and all the bricks spilled out. And now there was only a barrel weighing about 20 pounds. I refer, I refer you again to the weight in block number 11, which was 150. So 150 here, 20 here, so just the reverse of what had just happened. I met the barrel coming up as I was going down. This accounts for the two fractured ankles and the lacerations of my legs and lower body. The encounter with the barrel showed or slowed me enough to lessen my injuries when I fell on to the pile of, or yes, pile of bricks. Unfortunately, only three vertebrae were cracked. I'm sorry to report, however, that as I lay there on the bricks in pain, unable to stand, and watching the empty barrel 80 feet above me. I again lost my presence of mind and let go of the rope. And there was dot, dot, dots. He didn't go to further explain, explain, or to explain what had happened when that 20-pound barrel came hurtling down and landed on top of him. You know, you've probably read this or you've seen variations of it. They, there's one where uh, it talks about a sailor up in the mask of a ship lowering cables and tools that he'd used up there, or uh, on a radio tower, a steel working, working up there, and at the end of the day, lowering the tools that he used. Or uh, another one I saw was of a farmer at the top of a silo, a brick, you know, laying the bricks up there and having excess, the same type of scenario. Needless to say, 
the man that I just described encountered a number of surprises as outlined in his report. Now, I doubt if any of us have experienced anything quite similar. We might have started out services today a little like that, but, uh, you know, for the most part, I think most of us have enough common sense not to repeat something like this, um, don't we? However, in our minds sometimes, the events that, you know, to, uh, that occur to us seem to happen in such a consecutive manner, they seem to take on the magnitude of that example. So what is the point? That life is full of surprises? Well, that's true. That we should expect them? Also true. That we need to be able to cope with them when they occur? That's true as well. Let's review some basic facts or basic facets of elements regarding life and the fact that surprises like this will help us, um, that they will occur, and hopefully it'll help us to cope with them whenever we encounter them at some time in our future. And it's an absolute certainty that we will. You know, the word surprise can also be used interchangeably with the word change, because that is basically what happens when you're surprised. Surprises usually occur when something in a familiar um, area of our lives changes suddenly or dramatically, and it's something you weren't expecting. It happens without any warning. That is what creates the surprise. Something that's out of place. You know, it can be something good, like a diamond engagement ring or a new set of golf clubs, or it can be something that's bad, like getting a pink slip at work, or finding out that your spouse is pregnant and there is nothing wrong with that other than the fact at that point in your life you weren't financially prepared to add another uh, child to your family. But the one thing that we all know is that all of these examples will entail changes, some of which are minor and inconsequential, and others which can be very major and very significant. Now, if you have a new set of golf clubs, that may be something that is very enjoyable because it means you're going to be out on the golf course more often. Um, I'm not a golfer myself, but I know there was a man I worked with when he retired. That's practically what he did. He lived on the golf course. However, his spouse, I don't think, was quite as happy. She thought when they retired, they'd be doing things together. So there's a downside to that. Uh, she was looking forward to spending more time with him. Your girlfriend may be really excited about getting a diamond ring, but there may be another girl somewhere who uh, is heartbroken because she was expecting to get it. However, when you get to that point in any relationship, I think you pretty well can be assured you'll know whether or not that's going to be something in the likelihood you know, I, I really enjoy Hallmark movies. They've got a recipe that has various ways of happening, but it's like um, you, the man invites his girl to this fantastic restaurant for a great dinner, and she's all excited and all got all these anticipations. She's thinking she's going to receive a ring, and. And the conversation goes something like this. Uh, Susie, I want you to know you're really a great girl. And, and I really have enjoyed knowing you. But I think this time this 
relationship comes to an end. And of course, she's heartbroken in anticipation of what's going to happen. Or the man gets down on his knees to give his girl a ring and she said, I'm sorry, but I've been seeing someone else. So this type of thing, like I say, it's a recipe for the beginning of, of a lot of the movies, but it always has a happy ending, and that's what I like about them, because they do have happy endings. Turn to 11, uh, 2 Corinthians um, 11, verse 24. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 24, where we're reading what the Apostle Paul was telling about some of the surprises in his life. Of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. You know, back at that time, stripes were reserved for the worst offenders, and Paul was accustomed to them. However, 40 stripes were the maximum that were allowed uh, by the Jews. And if you want to look that up, it's in Deuteronomy 25, verse 3. For the sake of time, I won't go there, but it tells about um, the restrictions on giving stripes. However, the Jews, to make sure they didn't exceed that amount, usually gave only 39 because they were very self-righteous and they wanted to make sure they complied with the law. So if they accidentally gave an extra stripe, they would be within the law. So that's why, in case you wondered what the significance of the 39 was, that was the reason. And, and, and that was the only favor they ever gave uh, to Paul, uh, was the 39 stripes. They made sure he got the full uh, amount. The Gentiles weren't quite as uh, kind because when he fell into their hands, well, we'll read about it in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 25, thrice I was beaten with rods. And then he goes on and tells some of the other things. Once I was stoned, thrice I suffered shipwrecked. I'd say he had a bad habit of picking the wrong ships. A night and a day I've been in the deep, probably either dog paddling or hanging on to some part of the ship, uh, what was left of the ship. Verse 26, in journeyings often in perils of water, perils of robbers, my own countrymen, by the heathen, perils in the city. You couldn't walk down a dark alley without fear of being robbed, but also the highwaymen out in the country would lay in wait in different parts uh, where they could conceal themselves and then drop down and rob uh, the people going by in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils, and of course, this is one of the most disturbing things, in perils among false brethren. He was out often traveling in strange places, and it was always nice to look forward to being received by a church family. But he found out later that some of those people that he thought were his friends turned out to turn on him later. They were false brethren. They were the tares growing with the wheat. And that type of thing happened to him. In weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often. And we sometimes, when the Day of Atonement you know, rolls around, uh, it's difficult to cope with that fasting. Well, he fasted often, sometimes because he didn't have anything to eat, but other times because he knew in order to cope with all these things, he had to stay close to God. In cold and nakedness, besides these things that are without, also um, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. So 
You think of all the things he went through and then pile on that the church at Corinth, the church in Rome, the, church, the Galatians, the Ephesians, you go down and list all the letters, the churches he wrote to. And if you think um, that wasn't a responsibility, you don't totally understand what he was going through. Now, admittedly, this is an extreme example of the Apostle Paul. I don't know if I'd been presented with, you know, this array of challenges um, paraphrased in current language when I was, uh, you know, eager, well, when I was baptized, whether I would have been quite as eager to make the, uh, the commitment, but that, of course, is my human nature, my carnal side speaking. We all know that some of the things that have occurred to us since baptism, you know, they've been physically difficult, they've been psychologically difficult as well, but I think that we all know that if we've logged any time on this earth at all, you know, that's what we have to expect. Life presents an unending assortment of surprises for us. We learn that surprises and or changes will never stop occurring. They always will be part of the arsenal that we collectively refer to as, quote, life, unquote. As Christians, we don't necessarily have the same array of problems we just read about that Paul had confronting him on every side, but I'm sure that we all have had our own set of challenges right now, right here today. You may be facing some of them. Should I move or should I stay put? Should I change or not change? And that is a broad statement that could apply to anything in your life. Uh, it can apply to jobs, schools, relationships. We will find surprises in all of those different categories. Um, you know, you name it, and even uh, those broad and general categories, there will be surprises. It'll find your way into every niche, nook, and cranny of your life. So we've determined that surprises are here to stay. However, there is something else we need to realize about them, and that is that we can survive them. You know, we're very resilient in many ways, and we can survive the surprises and or changes or whatever life throws at us. Turn to Genesis 3, verse 17, Gen or I mean Genesis 31, verse 7, I should say. Genesis 31, verse 7. Jacob here is talking to his wives, Rachel and Leah, the daughters of Laban, and he's talking to them about how the, his father has treated him, or their father has treated him. And your father hath deceived me and changed my wages ten t times. Several translations use the word cheated for the word deceived, but God suffered him not to hurt me. You know, we probably don't consider it hurt what happened to him, but it certainly wasn't um, easy to serve seven years from, for one daughter and then end up having to serve seven for uh, the other. Turn to Genesis 29, verse 20, and this is just an aside. Genesis 29, verse 20. And one of the reasons he could do it was that Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days and the love he had to her. So a collateral lesson to be learned from the example is that if you love something enough, you will be willing to make the sacrifice necessary in order to acquire it. And I think as a lesson from that, we also need to apply that to the love we need to have for God and his kingdom. Going back to Genesis 31, and this time we'll look at verse 41. Genesis 31, verse 41. 
And here he's talking to Laban. Um, Thus have I been 20 years in your house and served thee 14 years for thy two daughters and six years for thy cattle, and thou hast changed my wages 10 times. And I'd like to return to another part of Jacob's story, which I think is somewhat relevant. In Genesis 27, verse 35, Genesis 27, verse 35, uh, this is where Isaac is talking to Esau, and he, Isaac said, thy brother came with subtlety and hath taken away thy blessing. Jacob's mother, Rebekah, and Jacob had conspired to do this, and you know, know that part of the story. And he, Esau, said, is not he rightly named Jacob, for he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. So returning to Genesis 31, verse 41, Genesis 31, verse 41, um, and this is the latter part of the verse, and thou hast changed my wages 10 times. He's once again talking to Laban. And the Hebrew word change comes from the word chalah, C-H-A-L-A-P-H, meaning slippery, smooth, or slick. It is in Strong's 2498, and it can mean change, substitute, alter, so it isn't constant. You have to watch your step or you may fall. It's like if you're dealing with a used car salesman, even though he tells you that car was used by a little old lady who was 94 and lived in Pasadena and it was 20 years old and had only had 10,000 miles on it. You know, talk about slippery. This is where you want to watch out. Well, this is what Laban was like. He either changed the method of payment or re Deuced it um, or only gave Jacob a measly increase or skipped the increase altogether. Doesn't really tell other than to infer he had cheated him, as some of the other translations allude to being what actually took place. God clearly tells us we reap what we sow. So maybe during his 20 years with uh, Laban, Jacob, reflected on what he'd done to his own brother. And maybe in a sense, uh, this was a little payback for that. Or it was just a time God wanted him to have to learn other lessons. Whatever the reason was, he would have, I'm sure, have thought back to the experience with his brother. You know, this example may apply to us in principle as we reflect on some of the things that have happened to us in our lives and how our own experiences and how later we analyze them to see what we learned as a result, the consequences of those actions. Yes, we can surprise or survive surprises. It may be difficult, it may not be easy, and I'm Think of Paul, what he went through, but it is possible. And why is that? Because God doesn't surprise us. God does not surprise us. Turn to Malachi 3, verse 6. Malachi 3, verse 6. For I am the eternal, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. You know, the benefits of the blessing and birthright Jacob received from his father are enjoyed by many of us uh, today, both nationally and individually as well. Turn to Hebrew thir Hebrews 13, verse 8. Hebrews 13, verse 8. It's a well-known scripture. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. He's constant, he's immovable, you know, his laws do not change. He doesn't, enter, uh, doesn't introduce surprises in our lives, unless, of course, they come in the form of unexpected blessings. 
and those are always good surprises, and we do have those. He's always the same, he's always constant. You know, we can always count on him as we can our Heavenly Father to help us when the need arises and when we cry out to him to give us that help. Why is it that we come here every week to be reminded of these things? Because we do have a relatively short span of attention and can be easily distracted if we're not careful. And especially sometimes when things in our lives are going south at a rapid rate, like the bucket of bricks I described when I started, we desperately need the words of encouragement and the reminder of God's power and influence in our lives. We are blessed to be constantly reminded of the fact that he is always here if we're willing to do our part in doing what it takes to seek him and create and build a strong and binding relationship with him. It certainly is no surprise that today is a new day and it, if you have fallen short at any time in the past, you can always resume your walk along the path with him again today, starting right now.